Hello. How are you? Hello. How are you? I think I know most of you. Hi. How are you? Nice to see you, Tiffany. Yeah, nice to see you again. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Hello. Nice to see you again. Good. How's it going? How are you? Good. Good to see you. Hi, Randy. How are you? Good to see you. Randy. Okay, so Dr. Lipa, we have 90 minutes. We have about 24 questions, and periodically throughout uh, the session, I will let you know how you're doing on time. Uh, and so, but to get started, why don't you, uh, if you could take a few minutes to introduce yourself and tell us why you would like to be the next state superintendent. Yes, well, first of all, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here with you today. And uh, just w I'd like to start by saying that I, I wish I wasn't here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Brian Wiston was a good friend of mine, and uh, we wish Brian was still our state superintendent. And I just felt I had to say that out loud. Uh, also want to take an opportunity to recognize Sheila Alice and the work that she's done on behalf of the state and schools across the state of Michigan. She's, I think, represented the department very well and want to recognize that. Uh, as you know, my name is Randy Leopa. I've uh, been in education for over 30, 30 years now. and. Uh, for the last 16 years, I've been either a regional or a local superintendent. And prior to that, I've been either an assistant superintendent or a superintendent for almost 30 years now. And so this has been my life work. This is uh, my passion, and, uh, and it's been my entire career. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, uh, certainly, that I'm, that I'm here today. I, uh, during that time and during that work, I've had the opportunity to have a lot of experiences and you know, certainly monitor what's been going on in education here in Michigan. Uh, I'm extremely proud of the things that I've been able to accomplish over that period of time. Uh, feel very good about many of the uh, things that have happened. Uh, feel great about the own experience that my three children had going through Michigan schools. And so I feel real good about that, and I know a lot of my colleagues feel real good about that. But in Michigan, we're also at a point in time where we're struggling. And we're not providing the education that uh, I think we would say that, that is uh, deserved uh, for our students. And we don't have to look at a whole lot of uh, uh, different uh, data points, but if you look at how we've done uh, over, over time on the NAEP, uh, if you look at where we're at with third grade proficiency and how many students have met the, the targets that we've set, uh, if you look at the percentage of students that have graduated and how many of them have either a degree or some type of post-secondary uh, uh, credential. Uh, we're falling behind our surrounding states. And so we're at a point in time where the trajectory has not been uh, what we want it to be. And that's hard for me to say as, as someone who's been in the profession for a long time and, and has dedicated my career to this work. Uh, but I will say there's good news. Yeah, I think we're at a point in time in our state where things are coming together and uh, I think the trajectory can change. And uh, I'm excited that it seems like, again, there's an alignment now, not just in the education community, but outside the education community that we have to do something. We have to do something uh, to move us forward and we have to do something different than we've done over the last maybe 10 or 15 years. And again, in my opinion, the great news is we've already got the roadmap. The top 10 and 10 is created. A lot of work went into that. Uh, we have a school finance research collaborative report that, while it's a finance report, is really not a finance report. It's a complete, detailed description about what quality school looks like and how we can get there. And so we've got the roadmaps. We don't have to recreate that, and I would suggest that we wouldn't recreate that. So that's a real positive thing. And I think we're at a point in time here in Michigan where we're ready to move ahead. We need to just prioritize those items in our top 10 and 10 from the SFRC report, and we need to get to work on them. And so uh, whoever does that work, I think, needs to be someone who has experience and background in how that was created, what's been the landscape here in Michigan. Uh, I certainly congratulate the board on the uh, finalists that you've chosen, because they are people in the field that know what it's like to do the work. And so I think you've got a great field to choose from. And uh, you know, with things aligning, I'm just excited. I mean, it's, it's time to get working and get this moving, and, and I'm all in. So what is the purpose of public education? Well, uh, 
not to be overly dramatic, but it's, I mean, it is the great equalizer. That's what public education is. It is uh, the vehicle that provides us the opportunity to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? That's, that is what public education can do. It is the, it's the vehicle that can allow us to uh, fulfill the uh, American dream. And so uh, it's those components uh, that make us different from a whole lot of places, something that we should be very proud of. And from a, from a public standpoint, when you think about it, I mean, there's certainly there's a private benefit for any individual that's going through the system, but there's a common good piece to this that an educated society is certainly going to be an, a society that is going to succeed economically, but it also is going to be a civil society. And it's going to be a society that, uh, that's going to be able to, to live and work in harmony. And that's the, that's the pure goal when we think about it. I, I am the product of this system. Uh, my, I'm, I'm the first uh, person in my family to go to college. Uh, my father was uh, an immigrant who uh, escaped the Russian invasion and at the end of World War II, left his family behind, and came here for the American dream, for the, for the thought of freedom, even though he didn't even know what that was. He was a teenager at the time. My mom made it through 10th grade, and that's as far as her education went. But when I grew up, the message that I had from my parents was, education is your way forward. And that was, uh, that was the message that I received uh, on a regular basis, and, uh, and here I am today. Uh, and, and so, you know, public education and the opportunity that anybody can succeed is really the purpose. <clears throat> okay. So during your first 90 days on the job, how might you go about determining the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the Michigan Department of Education, and what specific steps would you take? Now, this is really important, I think, because as we sit, your work, the superintendent's work, the work that we have is really identifying from our seat how do we improve education in Michigan. We know where the work happens. The work happens in schools with teachers in classrooms. That's where the work occurs. And so what's our influence? How are we going to do that? And so we look at the responsibilities that we have within the department and are we being as effective as we possibly can? Are we in alignment with our colleagues across the state of Michigan? Do we have a clear picture of what's going on uh, in our schools to best uh, provide that, that, that support? I feel that my role at the ISD as an ISD superintendent was very similar to that. It was about looking at where we sit uh, we don't do the work, I, as I tell people. Anybody remember the old BASF commercial? I don't create anything, I just make it better. Do you, I, okay, someone, <laughs> someone's gonna remember, someone remembers that. That's really what we, what we do at the ISD level and at a certain level what the department does. And I meet with every single new staff person that we hire at the ISD. I sit down with them, I talk to them. We have uh, two different district or uh, organization-wide meetings a year. And my message to them is, if we're not providing some added value to our local school systems, we just sh should not exist. There's no purpose for us to be there if we're not providing some added value. And I tell the new people when they come in, I say, when I drive into work every day, I don't get a chance to get in schools all that much. And so what am I doing to make a difference for that teacher in that, cl in that classroom? What am I doing to make a difference for that principal in their school? Uh, we have to maintain that focus on a regular basis. And so when we think about that SWOT analysis, I would look at those, that lens as what are we doing to provide value. And number one, I would, I would really want to set up a, a very uh, thorough input process uh, uh, for the superintendents. I know I like to have my voice heard uh, in regards to what's going on and what the department does. And so that's going to be really, really, at least in my eyes, really important to make sure that we have stakeholders in regularly in a, in a systemic, systemic process to be able to get feedback from them and to know what's going on in their schools. Uh, I meet individually with our superintendents every single year, and I ask them, what, what are your two big things going on next year? I want to I know what's happening, so that helps me help them. And so that would be one thing uh, that I would look at is the input process. I think that we need to look at each one of our departments and have a process to where we can look at what is the value add in each one of our areas. So we're thinking about that focus and that lens. Uh, I'm not talking about a scary process. Uh, 
uh, when I was in Livonia, we used a, uh, a process called lean management, and we would talk about being hard on process and easy on people. And so that's part of what you do with a SWOT analysis is you, you're hard on process, but you're, you're easy on people, and it's about what are we doing to add value. So I'd look at our departments uh, in that regard, and then I'd look at our partners because uh, especially, you know, you think about the history of the Michigan Department of Education over the last 20, 30 years, you know, the, the department is a lot smaller than it, than it used to be. We don't have the resources that we had 15 or 20 years ago. But what we do have are ISDs, what we do have are statewide education organizations. We have other resources with a lot of really smart people. And so we need to inventory that as part of that SWOT analysis and say, okay, where does this work need to go? Who's best uh, able to put that, you know, do that work with local school districts? And let's make sure that that work gets in those, in those right slots. We've got a lot of smart people in a lot of different organizations, and we should coordinate that through the department uh, to be as effective as we possibly can. Hi. Describe your leadership style and success in a large, complex organization. What do you consider to be your major strengths as a leader and please give examples? Yeah, so what, what I'd like to do is start with, the, first of all, the accomplishments and then talk about how the, my strengths and my, uh, at least my perceived strengths and my uh, perceived leadership style have, has led to uh, those, uh, uh, those accomplishments. And so, and I'll just talk about, you know, uh, being a, a superintendent for 12 years in Livonia Public Schools and the ISD superintendent for the last four years in Wayne County. Uh, they're both two large and complex organizations. Uh, Livonia was one of the largest school systems in the state. So, you know, we managed almost 30 buildings. Uh, we had over 3,000 W-2s at the end of the year, 1,000 teachers, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, almost uh, between 15 and 18,000 kids. Uh, and so it was a large, complex organization, and uh, I'm very proud of the work that we completed over uh, my tenure there. We were able to, uh, first and foremost, create a shared vision for our organization. It's one of the first things I did as a, as a superintendent. And I'm proud to say that that shared vision lives today in Livonia. It's the foundation of who we are and what we want to accomplish as a school system. And it kept our focus in regards to what we wanted to set as goals for our school district. And so, first and foremost, I'm, I'm you know, very proud of that work, how we did that work, and the fact that it's still alive today. Uh, we passed a $190 million bond issue a few years ago. Uh, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, uh, asking for additional money is, is uh, always a, a respectful thing when, when, when we talk about uh, our organizations and, and what we're asking our communities to do to support us. Uh, but that was a significant effort to put that together, to plan it outright, and to shared with the community why this was an investment and that uh, uh, bond issue passed, which is now just about completed, has completely redone uh, the school district. Uh, we, we were the first uh, school system or one of the first school systems to go through uh, district-wide accreditation and uh, receive that uh, recognition. Uh, we were in a position over a lot of years of living with and living through declining enrollment. And so as part of that, we reorganized the school district and uh, through that process, we reorganized uh, how our schools were organized, the grade levels. And by doing that, we did close seven schools, which anybody who's lived through school closings, it's no fun. Uh, but we lived through it, and we did it with a uh, goal that our schools would be better afterwards. And so we identified the educational improvements that would come through this reorganization process that we set up. We saved millions of dollars. Uh, but more importantly, we, we set our school district up to be successful moving forward. And that uh, model that we set up is, has uh, served them well over the last 15 years. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we created new programs. Uh, we were the first high school to have an international baccalaureate uh, uh, program in Wayne County. Uh, we, had, uh, we were one of the first schools to implement Leader and Me programs across the state of Michigan, or across the, our, our school system. Uh, and so we had... We had uh, implemented a variety of unique programs, again, uh, pre during a time where we were really uh, having to pull back because of uh, resources. And so uh, over my tenure uh, as a superintendent, we cut $20 million, or $50 million, I'm sorry. Uh, but we maintained our priorities and our programs and our pride in regards to what we were able to offer uh, our families. At the ISD level, a variety of things. Uh, first and foremost, my focus has been on educational services. Uh, 
I think our biggest uh, uh, support for our local school districts is the support that we have through curriculum and instruction. Uh, many of our school districts, especially our smaller school districts that don't have scale, just don't have the expertise and assessment in every curriculum area in school improvement. Uh, they don't have the same kind of expertise uh, that we can share with them. And so that's a significant area that we have worked on over the last several years. The first thing and one of the most significant things that we did was pass the regional enhancement millage. And uh, that was not an easy thing to do. Uh, uh, but we got it done, and that just completely changed the conversation in our, uh, in our school districts. Again, I meet with our superintendents individually, 33 of them every single year, meet with them over the summer, ask them what's going on, and the conversation from before the millage and after the millage were completely different. And so, as I would tell my local superintendents, we can do a lot of things for you, but getting you 360 bucks a kid was a pretty big deal. And that really helped our school districts to uh, uh, change the, the course and, and the conversation about what they're focused on in, in their local school districts. We also have implemented some, I think, very unique programs. Uh, I had a chance to share with you when you came to visit with us uh, the career counseling program that we put in place. Again, trying to find value add, trying to find pieces in schools that aren't there right now that we could fill. And we know how, uh, how how our counselors have so much on their plates in their local school systems. And so we hire career counselors that are experts in working with kids in regards to what their game plan, what their game plan will be. And we're out in uh, now 28 schools, and this year we'll have touched over 2,000 high school seniors with our Ready to Launch program, and they will have an action plan when they walk out of high school about what they're going to do. Just started a new initiative down in Detroit where we're working with the community groups, with the uh, um, with the uh, uh, churches and others to put together a program. Again, this is value add, something the school district you know, isn't doing within their realm. And what we're doing is we're going and training parents, where we're training volunteers to work with parents so they, have, they can share with them the skills that they need in order to, have good, uh, to help their children be good readers. We know, that we, you know, we know the research in regards to what happens, early brain development, uh, the word gap between rich families and poor families. Um, this work, it's actually a curriculum called uh, Talking is Teaching. Uh, it's promoted right now by the Clinton Foundation across the country. And we're excited that we're actually trying to take this to scale uh, in uh, some of our communities so those parents have the simple skills that will make a significant difference. So when they actually get to preschool, they'll be more prepared than they are today. Uh, so a lot of things going on uh, in Wayne County to support our local school districts. And we're very proud of them. As it relates to my leadership style uh, and my, uh, and you know, really what I think my strengths are, I think my strengths are number one, to build relationships, uh, to number two, to motivate people. Uh, I think if you would talk at the, uh, to the staff that worked with me in either the Livonia or at Wayne Risa, what you would hear from them is, you know, we want, we, we, we want to do a good job because Randy believes in us. He uh, values the work that we do and he advocates for us. And so I think that's a significant strength that I have in regards to how do you motivate and move thousands of people, which is what we're trying to do in large organizations. Uh, building relationships both within the school system, but then also outside of the school <laughs> district, I would identify also as a strength. And really a strength I would identify is my ability to basically take an issue or take issues, break them down, take the complex, make them more simple, put a plan together and actually move it forward. And so when you hear me talk about, hey, the plans are in place, we don't need more studies, it's time to do the work, it's really based on uh, what I like to do, which is let's get down, uh, I don't, I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty, uh, let's, get, let's get the work done. The Michigan Department of Education developed a top 10 and 10 plan. What are your thoughts on the plan? Are there any changes, additions, or deletions you would recommend to this plan? Well, uh, first of all, I think it's an outstanding plan. Uh, the, the components uh, that I like about it or the process that I like that, we, that was uh, used to, to create it was, number one, it got a lot of input. There's a lot of input in creating it. Number two, it was research-based, and so it's based on good, positive research. I believe that if you want to talk to any educator in the state of Michigan today and you ask them, what should we do to improve education? They're going to tell you a lot of things. You're going to find it in the top 10 and 10, I believe, uh, wholeheartedly. 
And so I believe the plan is very well thought out and very well prepared. I would not suggest any changes to it. Uh, what I would suggest is what we need to do is highlight and identify the things that are most important that will be the most impactful, uh, especially where we're at in our state right now with student achievement. What's the most impactful things in that top 10 and 10 list? And let's coalesce around that and start working on it. I think we need input in regards to doing that. Uh, I'll just share my own thoughts, and that is uh, goal three and goal four are significant, at least in my eyes. Uh, and I think it'll be a common theme that you'll hear throughout my, my time with you this morning. Uh, and that is we need to make sure that we have a strong and qualified and well-trained workforce. And we need to make sure that they have the resources that they need to do their job. And those resources need to identify the fact that when kids come to us, they're not all the same. They have different needs. And so different schools will need different resources in order for them to get their students at the same level that we want all students. And so that is really highlighted in three and four uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the work that's done with the uh, top 10 and 10 plan. And uh, I really think that, that is, that's where it's at. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, from our seat, what can we do to help local school districts? Again, the work happens in classrooms with kids. That's where the work is, and whatever we can do to influence that is what we need to do. And we need to make sure that we have highly qualified teachers in every single classroom. We can, uh, you know, that we, there can be a, a lot of good things that we can have in place, but if we don't have that in place, we're, we're, we're just uh, not going to be successful. And so that has to be a focus for our of ours, and uh, we need to uh, make sure that they have the resources that they need to do their job. I mean, uh, it it's, uh, uh, sounds pretty basic, but uh, the research is very clear around that. I, I don't know if you're familiar with John Hattie's research. Uh, he's identified hundreds of different things that impact student achievement, that impact how successful students will be in school. And he's done this now for several years. And what comes out on top all the time is that if you have a teacher that is inspired, well-trained, qualified, working together with their colleagues to be better, a big component of that, they have to do collaborative work. If they're doing that, the impact that he's found is significantly higher than any of the other criteria that he's identified, and that includes socioeconomics. And so if we're looking at how we can make an impact, if we have quality teachers in our schools, well-trained, with the resources that they need to be successful, that's how we're going to make the that's how we're going to make the most significant impact. Thank you. One of the most important tasks of the superintendent is advocating for the board's strategic plan for improving education, with the executive office, the legislature, and educational interest groups. How would you describe your experience and approach in doing this successfully? And how would you manage situations where the legislature and the executive office are in conflict related to educational policy and implementation? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think this would be an area that uh, uh, would be a significant strength of mine. Uh, and I think it's an area, uh, as we think about uh, being able to move this agenda forward uh, of the top 10 and 10 in the school finance research form, uh, research collaborative, it's going to have to be someone who has these skills and can hit the ground running with all the stakeholders across the state of Michigan. And so uh, uh, I'm going to bore you a little bit with some of my history with this, but it starts really back in the 80s. Uh, I was actually working uh, at Wayne Westland at the time, and uh, one of the things that I did was analyze uh, ed educational policy that was coming out of Lansing. Worked on that uh, pretty regularly, and shortly thereafter, what happened? Proposal A. Uh, I was uh, all of uh, 31 years old, wandering the Capitol, uh, and what happened when Proposal A went in, into place? And they were talking about those plans, and I don't know if you remember some of the other plans. There were actually ballot proposals that failed prior to that, and there was a Olmstead Kearney plan and the Star plan, uh, and uh, then the infamous day where uh, Debbie Stabenow challenged the governor. Engler, and uh, they basically crashed the system, and, and uh, they were in the process for six months to create a new system. Uh, and what happened to Wayne Westland at that point in time was we had just lost a millage of about 10 mills, and we couldn't get it repassed because they were waiting for the state to fix it. So the problem was they were going to tie you basically where your foundation was at the point in time when Proposal A went into place. 
and we were down 10 mils from years prior to that. And so I just was not going to take no for an answer. And so that was, uh, you know, a trial by fire. I was up in Lansing on a regular basis as the assistant superintendent and uh, basically made a list of people that were also impacted by this particular legislation, identified why logically this issue needed to be addressed, and then went out and found legislators and started talking to them. Uh, and uh, any hour of the day or night, I was there. Uh, the, some of the old-time lobbyists. Anybody remember Jerry Dunn? Oh, I tell you, I'm just amazing myself. <laughs> Jerry Dunn, the uh, uh, chair of the old Maisel uh, lobbying organization, he would be telling me, Randy, you got to go home. you got to go home. Uh, but we weren't going to let that rest. And lo and behold, on Christmas Eve day, when they actually finalized Proposal A at that time, I got a call from our legislator, and we were able to get half that money back. And that was a big deal for us. It was an $11 million categorical. We in Wayne Westland received $6 million to $11 million. And uh, that was my uh, kickoff into working on legislation. I've been actively involved ever since. When I became a superintendent in 2002, uh, that work continued. Uh, and I had uh, similar experiences after that. In 2009, uh, in the middle of the school year, uh, we received a call and said that we had just lost our 20J money and we had just lost $5 million in, uh, in the middle of October. And so we had to do something to address that. It was uh, quite an interesting day. I wasn't quiet about my concerns. And believe it or not, Jennifer Granholm showed up in my office by herself at noon that day to talk to me about the categorical that we had lost. Um, we continued to work on it. It took us a couple of years, uh, but we were able to work out legislation through, the, through that same process I identified. There were only a handful of districts, actually, one district represented by Senator uh, Gretchen Whitmer. And uh, we worked together with our local legislators and were able to uh, get that money restored. Two years after that, I got a call at 7.30 at night from our local legislator who said the state uh, uh, legislature is going to vote on the school aid bill tomorrow and you are going to get a $5 decrease in your overall school funding. And I couldn't believe that any district was going to get a deduction. So we went into action, got the list of people that were impacted. I was up at 6 in the morning driving up here, calling superintendents. They were calling legislators. Uh, we were able to get the bill slowed down uh, for a few hours. And by uh, that afternoon, we were able to have a categorical put into the school aid bill that generated about, uh, it was only about 5 or $6 million, but it took care of those school districts and at least got us a $5 per student increase. And so those are just examples of ways that over the years I've been able to uh, I think through a, a reasonable and fair process, go through and, and make changes in legislation. I've worked on a variety of legislation over the years, 1280C, teacher evaluation, uh, 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 the EAA bills when they were coming through, uh, tangentially when they were working on the uh, rebirth of the Detroit public school systems, uh, a variety of different uh, uh, activities that I've been involved in. Uh, I've been on the uh, MASA Legislative Committee now for well over 10 years. I first represented Region 9, which is Oakland, Mon Macomb, and Wayne as a local superintendent. Now I represent uh, Region 10 as an ISD superintendent. And so I've been very actively involved with all of our associations in regards to promoting good policy uh, as it relates to legislation. Uh, I was the chair of the Wayne County Legislative uh, Committee of Superintendents for seven years uh, until I became an ISD superintendent. Uh, I have testified uh, in front of the legislative committees numerous times. I, 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 I can't count them, but uh, several times, many times, I've been in front of the legislative committees testifying on a variety of different issues. Uh, I have been you know, interviewed, TV, radio, uh, local print news. Um, I can't tell you how many times over the last uh, 15 years. Um, but that is work that I've done at, at a very long and, and uh, 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 in-depth level for a very long time. Thank you. And the next question is, uh, how have you been able to build an, to build effective working relationships with unions and other organized educational groups? What about the business community? And give us specific examples. And this ties a little bit into uh, a variety of things that I was just describing. You know, I've just been very actively involved in uh, the educational community and all of the educational organizations for a long time. Uh, uh, my experience and my time uh, involved in these organizations is, uh, is quite extensive. 
And so uh, uh, I think first and foremost, the reason people invite me to be uh, involved in these organizations is because um, they see value in my input, but they also know that I value their input. And so they know I'm a good team player and that I work well, uh, but I'm also a problem solver. And, uh, and you know, sometimes when you get on committees, there aren't a lot of doers, and I'm, I'm a doer. I'm someone who will, who will help to get things done. And so I've been invited to be involved in a lot of different educational uh, groups and organizations. Uh, I mentioned some of them already. Uh, I would highlight that right now I'm the president of the Intermediate School Districts Association. Uh, I have uh, also been uh, uh, on the executive board and was president-elect, uh, chosen by my colleagues for the Tri-County Alliance of Superintendents. Uh, was the president of the Wayne County Superintendents Organization for several years. Uh, and. Uh, a variety of other organizations. Again, I, I mentioned that I was involved with the MASA group. I'm involved with two significant uh, uh, efforts right now that involve not just uh, the educational community, but the business community. The uh, School Finance Research Collaborative was a group of, uh, uh, a very interesting group that came together to talk about the state school funding system. And uh, I think you guys just recently uh, had a presentation from the, the School Finance Research Group. <laughs> But you know that it was, uh, it's made up of former legislators, Republicans, Democrats, uh, business people, uh, people from higher ed, the, the uh, philanthropic uh, uh, community, all involved and all working together. And I've been actively involved with that organization. They've chose me to be on their steering committee. And I have, uh, my gosh, I'm probably up to 50 presentations now across the state of Michigan talking about the research completed by the School Finance Research Collaborative. Uh, I was also, or I also am uh, a member of the steering committee for Launch Michigan, a uh, very interesting organization now that's trying to come together, uh, the business community and, uh, and uh, the education community, along with other interested groups who want to try to work together on policy. You know, we haven't always been on the same page as it relates to how we can move Michigan forward. Again, this is, you know, I mentioned earlier how I think that, you know, things are starting to align. And I think this is one example where people are coming together and saying, look, it, we, we understand that things aren't working the way it needs to work in our educational system here in Michigan. And so Launch Michigan is really a product of that. I'm actually a co-chair with Rob Fowler, who's the uh, president of the school business uh, or the uh, Small Business uh, Association of Michigan uh, on the finance subcommittee, uh, and I'm actually actively uh, in, involved in that. Uh, I was uh, involved with the Coalition for Detroit School Children the organization that was initially created to recreate and rebirth the, 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 the Detroit public school system uh, and uh, uh, came in after that initial work as the ISD superintendent, but have been involved uh, uh, with uh, that organization and, in fact, was uh, asked to be the co-chair of the special education group along with John Ricolta. Michelle was on the, uh, organiz uh, on the committee with us, and, uh, and so I've been uh, active uh, with that organization. Do a lot of work with the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'm on their Detroit Drives uh, Commission. I'm on uh, their uh, Detroit College Access Network uh, Committee. Uh, do work with a lot of community organizations. Uh, 482 Forward, if you've ever heard of them, a significant advocacy group in Detroit. Do a lot of work with them. I've done multiple presentations with them uh, and, uh, and partner with them on a variety of things uh, uh, and, and in a variety of different ways. The Michigan PTSA have been very actively involved with for many years. I was the administrator of the year in 2014, as chosen by the Michigan PTSA. And so, uh, and then I'll talk about the unions uh, also, because I, I certainly know well the leadership of the unions uh, at the state level. Uh, but at the local level, I had a great relationship with our uh, local unions. Uh, I received some feedback uh, when I was young, taking a class, I think it was 1990. And uh, my professor said uh, to, the, to the class, not to me, you will get the union that you deserve. And that always stuck with me. And it's about re building relationships and how you work with people. And so uh, on the local level and on the state level, I've been able to build relationships uh, with our unions. And again, uh, I just emphasize that with the point in time where we're at in Michigan right now, we have a window of opportunity here to move ourselves forward. And we're going to need someone who has those relationships with all those different organizations to help to help move us forward. Thank you.
Randy, as State Superintendent of Public Education, how would you ensure accountability within the Michigan Department of Education? How would you judge your own effectiveness as a State Superintendent? Please describe the internal accountability system you would put in place. Yeah, and, and uh, I want to talk about a process that I've used throughout my year, uh, a career as a superintendent. And, and really, it's to some extent to hold myself accountable, but also to hold the staff accountable. And so what I do every year is I sit down with my board, with our board, and we collectively at the beginning of the year set our goals. And so uh, we have a process in place where we first, as a staff, sit down and identify what we think the important things are in the organization that we want to accomplish. Then we say, okay, well, over the next year, what are we going to work on? What are the specific things that we're going to work on? And then we go to the board and we sit down and we talk about those items. And we also get input from the board and say, okay, what, what are we missing here? What are your priorities? What else from your eyes should we be working on? Do we want to make sure, and do we want to make sure that we're setting up as a goal for next year? And so in through that process, you know, you, typically you don't want to have that many goals, but I've Typically, we're working on a lot of different things in big, large, complex organizations. You know, well, we would typically have 10 to 15 items that we would want to work on for that upcoming year. We would identify specific measurements for those goals so we knew if we were, if we were meeting them. We would do regular updates with the board to say, hey, I want to give you some feedback now. Here's how these are going. Uh, this one's going great. This one we haven't gotten to yet. This one we're in the middle of. Here's what's working well. Here's what's not working well. Um, so there are no surprises, but what that really does for us from an accountability standpoint is it does hold us accountability to what the organization has identified is important and they want to get done. And also what it does is it keeps our focus because, I mean, you know, you guys know this. You guys have been involved in and around education. You know, there are a thousand things for us to get involved in. There are a thousand good ideas out there. And if you don't stay focused and if you don't have a game plan and you don't have, if you don't have that identified, here's what we're going to do and here's what we're going to focus on. It's not that you're not going to work on other things, but you are going to get those things accomplished. And so that is, uh, that is from a, a standpoint of accountability, how uh, I've held uh, myself accountable and how I hold the, uh, hold the staff accountable because typically those items are items that are implemented by our staff, not by me. Separate from that, I would say that we would need some outcome goals. I think that's important. I would just share some things that I've used in the past. When I was a local superintendent, uh, I like to have a lot of different measurements, multiple measurements to, to determine how we were doing. And so one of the things we would do is we would say for our state assessment, for every single grade level and every single content area, we would identify, in Livonia, we wanted to be in the top 25% of the Tri-County area. And so that was a goal of ours. And so we would set that as one goal. Another thing that we did, separate from that, is we said, okay, we're going to identify 18 school systems that are very similar to us, that have similar demographics. And we would say that we want to be, uh, on the state assessment, we want to be uh, either at, above the median, or no, we want to be both above the median and above the mean in regards to our student achievement in those particular areas. And last, we, set aside, we would set up a school improvement plan every single year that had goals in it, it had academic outcome goals, and that was the last component of it. And we would say that we want to make sure that we're meeting the growth uh, expectations that we identified in our school improvement plan. And so if you added all those up, it was probably you know, 30 plus items that we were able to identify from an outcome standpoint uh, and say, okay, from an outcome standpoint, uh, and that's how I was evaluated. I'd say, okay, well, if, I get, you know, if we're in this percentage, I get a four, this, I get a three, whatever. I didn't really care about that as much as the fact that we were focused on that that was important for us. Our staff knew that was important for us. And so those were the outcome goals that we set. The other goals that we set were through that other process. And those, those are the ways that uh, that same process, I think, is a way that we can hold ourselves accountable here in the department. Uh, just to give you an update, uh, we are almost halfway through. Um, but we're not quite halfway through with the questions, okay. so <laughs> just so you know. Uh, given the changing dynamics of public education, what do you see as the most critical issues facing the Michigan education system in the next three to five years? Uh, uh, one word, talent. Uh, when we look at where we're at, and I'm going to go back to the research of Hattie and the fact that if we're going to make significant impact here in the state of Michigan, we have to focus on What's going on in our classrooms with teachers? Do we have a quality teacher in place? Are they trained? Do they have the resources that they need? And so if that is the 
the area that we can make the most impact on, talent uh, is a significant component. And uh, uh, personally, I am concerned. Uh, the, and, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this, but the number of students that are going into education is declining in our state. Uh, we're seeing it, especially in our poor communities, the struggle that they have to maintain staff or to find staff. And so we have to address that issue head on. Uh, there are a variety of neat things that I've seen that have come up recently that I think are ideas and ways to start to address this. Uh, maybe you've heard in Detroit, they're working with Mary Grove College to start a residency program based after the hospital residency program. It's really a neat concept. Wayne State is putting in place a program where they're going to invite in high school seniors to do a career awareness around the idea and the thought of being a teacher. Uh, Dearborn Public Schools is putting in an early college. You know, we all know about the early college program. They're putting in an early college for students that want to be teachers. Uh, we're doing some things with the community colleges to fast track uh, the certification process. Uh, but we have to be aggressive in this area. We have to find new and different ways to address this because uh, it, uh, I'll, I'll use the, uh, the people who are watching that know me know that I'll use at least one baseball analogy with you today. <laughs> so my baseball analogy today is Ron Gardenhire. He's a heck of a manager. He is one of the, I think, one of the top managers in the entire, uh, in, entire major leagues. But the Tigers are predicted to lose maybe 100 games this year. He has a great game plan, but if he doesn't have the people in the field to execute the game plan, it's just not going to happen. And so again, goal three, goal four, top 10, uh, that I think is the most critical area that we're facing over the next uh, several years. I just add one other thing to that, and that is this focus, is, especially as we spent this time on career counselors in our county, making sure that kids have a good game plan when they leave college. Uh, not, not just that they have the skills that they need, but they have a game plan moving forward, I think, is a, an area uh, that's going to be very critical for us over the next uh, three to five years. You mean high school, not college, correct? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, what does an effective accountability system look like? If you were to design one from scratch, what elements would you include and what would you eliminate? How would the system hold schools and districts accountable for student achievement? I like the, uh, uh, what the department's done with the current accountability system. I think the parent transparency uh, uh, dashboard is excellent. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm the first one to uh, uh, share my input if, if uh, there's something with the, the state accountability system that, that I would disagree with. But that uh, transparency dashboard really outlines key areas that are important, but it also measures yourself against your peers and also against the state. And so from a parent's standpoint, to be able to go and get a quick, quick uh, snapshot of what's going on in the local school district, it's all right there. Proficiency, growth, staffing, uh, 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 attendance, uh, is, I think it's a really uh, good uh, 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 tool. And then the index system, which of course meets all the ESSA requirements, is something that I think is, is, is a, uh, a, a good product too. Um, one of the things I would offer uh, with an accountability system and with other things that we do is, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I think you're aware of this, but in the field, no more changes. Can we please, if we're going to have a target, can we keep the target the same and have us continue to move towards that target over a period of time? And so that would be uh, another uh, uh, reason that I like the current accountability system. I don't want to change it again. I think we need to allow school districts time to work towards those targets that have been identified, and we need to do the best we can to not continually change the, 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 the target for them. If I was to create one from scratch, uh, I personally have enjoyed uh, as a ISD superintendent, as a local superintendent, going through the accreditation process. And so the reason I identify that is it's, it's just such a, a much more rich process to get constructive feedback about what's going on in your school. They have multiple measures in regards to rate your school system in regards to, do you have a quality school? Are you meeting the components that would have you have a quality school? They look at systems, they go in and visit schools. It's intense. Make no mistake, it's exhausting for staff. You know, I mean, when you go through, no different than a hospital when they go through their process. When a local school district goes through that local accreditation process, that's, uh, that's you know, that's always, oh my gosh, it's the year we're going through the, the process. But what comes out of that, to me, is so much more rich and meaningful for a local school system, and it's so much more reflective, and it allows a school district to be reflective. 
you know, we don't get a lot of chance to do that because we're, you know, local superintendents, they're, they're moving all the time and they're trying to move the needle. It's an opportunity to be reflective and say, okay, here's some things that we're really doing well. Here are some things that we need to work on and either we're accredited or we're not. So if I was starting from scratch, that is a system that I think works rather well. Having said that, uh, we need to keep the target where it's been and I do like what's been created through the department. Okay, so um, describe best practices in school turnaround, including the role of the State Department of Ed. And it's been a significant portion of our work down in Wayne County. You know, we have the most partnership schools in the entire state of Michigan. Used to be the old priority school system. We've worked with the SRO. We worked when it was, it was in DTMB. We're now working with it. Thank God, Brian, for bringing it back to the Michigan Department of Education. But we've got a lot of experience in this area. And I just have to say, uh, you know, there, there isn't magic as it relates to school turnaround. It is good school improvement. That's what turnaround is. I mean, if you talk to anybody that's in the mix doing the work, if you look at the components of good school improvement, do I have a talented teacher in front of kids? Are they trained? Do they have a guaranteed and viable curriculum? Do they have an assessment, a formative assessment to check how kids are doing throughout the year to make sure that they have the opportunity to change their instruction to improve? Have they been trained in those areas? Do they have the resources that they need? Is the culture in the building the culture that's uh, a safe and warm environment for kids? Those contents uh, or those components of good school improvement are the components of good school turnaround work. And it's just more intense and it is more focused. My advice to school districts that are going through that process and how we support them is you need a good partner, especially our smaller school districts. You know, I mean, they'll have three or four people in their central office, right? They're doing everything. They're, student, they're the student accounting expert. Uh, they got to do HR. You know, they have a lot of responsibilities. You look at the intermediate school district, we have assessment experts. We have content experts in every content area. We have health experts. We have assessment experts. We, we have school improvement experts. And you need a partner like that to come in to fill those gaps for you, for your staff that aren't going to be experts in all those areas. So number one, good school improvement uh, or turnaround work is good school improvement work, but you need a good partner to help you out. You need the resources that you need uh, that, that are necessary in order for you to be successful. Uh, and we know that schools that are low performing and have uh, students that are economically disadvantaged need more resources. And we have good research now to tell us what that looks like. And so that, I believe, has to be a component of, uh, of good turnaround work too. And I would just add that you know, I go to the partnership meetings in Detroit every single month. What's happening in DPSCD is wonderful. They have a remarkable leader. He has brought in some of the top uh, uh, curriculum and instruction experts uh, that I have ever worked with. I'd hire them in two seconds for any job, any, any place, anywhere. They have, uh, they're drinking from a fire hose, make no mistake about it. But the processes that they're putting in place are the right processes. And when I talk to them about the work that they're doing, it's, it's disheartening. What are your biggest things you're working on this year? Well, Randy, we have to make sure that we have a qualified and talented teacher in every classroom. They've gotten down the openings from 20 down to 200 down to 30. We have adopted a new curriculum. We now have a new formative assessment. We're training our teachers on that. We're gonna get them to use it. They're doing all the right things. No, no gimmicks, no games. They're doing the right school improvement work. And I believe you're gonna see results in Detroit uh, over a period of time. Question number 12 is, if we were to talk to your greatest critic in your current position and or organization, what would their criticism be of you and what would be their greatest compliment? Well, I'm glad that I'm answering this question as an ISD superintendent. Uh, as a local superintendent, you have a lot more critics <laughs> and, uh, and they're a lot more critical. Uh, as an ISD superintendent, my job is to come to work every day and say, how am I helping people? And so, and we're not quite on the front lines like they are in a local school district. Uh, but I, I think the way that I would answer that question is uh, that people who would be critics of mine would say that we're either not focusing on the right priorities or we're not focusing on what they believe is important within, uh, within or outside of the organization. And, you know, just, uh, and, and, and if I was to go back to my uh, uh, local school district days, uh, I would say uh, something very similar to that. Um, but would add to, uh, add to that that it really is related around uh, the, the um, uh, 
things that we've decided to do to, to implement and to uh, uh, focus on within the school district, uh, uh, they would say that. Um, what would be their biggest compliment? I think uh, uh, one of the things I've been most proud of really in, in my entire career is uh, uh, I've been able to build relationships with a lot of people. And over time, I've had people that have been very critical of me, people who uh, uh, have uh, not been happy with me. Uh, at the end of the day, we've been, uh, for lack of a better term, friends. Uh, maybe not personal friends, of course, but friendly. We've gotten along. Uh, uh, we enjoy still talking to each other. We, we're able to move on, uh, and um, and I, I, I feel really, really good about that. I can assure you, not all of my critics would would uh, be in that in, in that uh, vein, but it's something that I feel real good about, and I think that's what they would say. How would you define the role of the state superintendent and the state board of education? What is your understanding of the relationship between the superintendent and the board? Well, there's a constitutional uh, 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 description in regards to what the responsibilities are. The State Board of Education is responsible for leadership, and they're responsible for uh, supervisory uh, and uh, uh, overall responsibility for the, the K-12 system. The state superintendent is responsible for the Department of uh, Education uh, operation and also uh, implementing the goals of the state board. Uh, uh, and so that's the, the formal uh, uh, description. I think the uh, uh, practical description is really looking, again, that's that conversation about what, from our seat and from our role, can we do to make a difference in our schools across the state of Michigan. And so it's really looking through that lens of what are we doing to add value? What are we doing to support what's happening in local schools? I mean, we have to come to work every day and say, what are we doing that's going to actually, a teacher in the classroom is going to say, oh, okay, that, that actually makes a difference for me. And having that focus and... Uh, uh, that thought process in regards to the operation of the department and the operation of our work is important. I see it basically in two areas. We have a significant advocacy responsibility. Uh, you guys were all elected on a statewide ballot. Millions of votes, millions of people voted for you. You have a voice. You are important people. And we need to be advocates. The state superintendent is and should be an important position, and we should be there working with our local school systems seamlessly to send a message about how we're going to improve education in the state of Michigan. I think that's one major responsibility we have. And of course, in the department, we've got a variety of uh, you know, compliance responsibilities and oversight responsibilities. But our responsibility at the end of the day, that goes back to that SWOT analysis. We really need to take a look at what we're doing and making sure that we're in line with what's going on in schools, we understand what's going on in schools, and we are adding value to what's happening in our local schools. Those, that's the way I would define it. And the relationship with the board, I, I can only sh share with you my experience, 16 years of being a superintendent. And I know the responsibilities are a little different in regards to a local superintendent and their board and the state superintendent and the state board. But from a practical standpoint, I see no difference. I mean, we have to be a team. We, sh we should be a team of nine, working together, talking regularly, communicating. I want to know what you are interested in, there's a reason you guys ran for a statewide position. I want to know what that is. You all bring value to the process. Hopefully, whoever the new superintendent will bring, bring value to the process. And we need to build those relationships and, and work as a team together. Uh, because if we don't, it'll impact 1.5 million kids. As state superintendent, you will be responsible for a large budget. Uh, what are some of the principles you believe are key to building and managing a budget, and what do you foresee your role in the state budgetary process? And I understand you've really hit on some of these yes. points already. Right, yeah, and, and, I, and my experience certainly is budgets. I mean, I, when I was assistant superintendent, I was super, assistant superintendent for either general administration or, or uh, uh, business and operations, and so I've been building budgets for almost 30 years. I think there's some basic conceptual issues with budgets. Number one, it should be a reflection of your priorities. Uh, I think a budget tells a story about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I think there are some basic tenets and principles. You want to make sure that you receive input in regards to building that budget. Uh, again, you need to make sure that it, it, uh, that budget is reflective of what's important to you and what you're trying to get done. And uh, 
and you know those are the basic components. Uh, you know, so it's not just it's just not a, a sheet of numbers. It really is. It's a book, and it tells really a story about what what's important to you and what you want to accomplish. And from a state level, again, I'll go back to what I just said about advocacy. I don't think there's a more significant thing uh, uh, than, or I think that's a very significant thing for us to be involved in, is having input and feedback into the state budget. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, at least in my case, again, I think having a new superintendent who can hit the ground running, who knows the players, will be helpful. Uh, hard to do in term limits. People move in and out. Uh, and so uh, that happens. But in the governor's office, you know, I worked for many years with Emily Laidlaw, who is their chief policy person. I've worked for uh, several years with Mark Burton, who's their chief strategist. And so I think those uh, ongoing connections uh, are helpful, especially if we're looking at inputting those components of the School Finance Research Collaborative, which we're so excited about to see in the governor's budget. I can't tell you, as someone who does presentations out in the field, to be able to point to something and say, well, this is what it actually looks like. This is how we start to move towards implementing this on behalf of our kids. Uh, it's important. So that, it's a very, very important role, I think, for the Board of Education. Okay, the next question. How would you handle decisions that are unpopular with stakeholders but educationally necessary for the state education system to meet the needs of the children Please cite actual examples, please. Yes, and uh, again, uh, being a, a superintendent for 16 years, I've had a lot of opportunity to uh, uh, make uh, to make unpopular decisions, uh, and um, I certainly can cite a, a variety of, of examples with that. Uh, one of my superintendent colleagues uh, uh, who just retired told his incoming a new superintendent that basically you have a 10-year shelf life because every year you're going to make 10% of the people mad. And so by the time 10 years is up, you know, if you're lucky, you're going to be pretty much done. Um, and that's, the real, that's just the reality of our work. We know that. You know that. Uh, and so I think what is, what is really, really important as we think about that is the process. And do we have the right process in place when we're getting ready to make a decision that will help to put us in the strongest position we can possibly be in when, that's, when that is made? And so, you know, have we gotten appropriate input? Have we vetted all of the pros and cons? Have we asked ourselves the tough questions in regards to every scenario that we can think of that would impact that overall uh, decision? Those are components of a process that, if they're in place, will at least put you in a strong position when you make that decision uh, that, is, uh, that is unpopular. Uh, I think I speak on behalf of all five of the candidates that we're really excited that you guys are almost done with social studies. <laughs> so uh, it would be at least maybe one, new de one decision that the new superintendent uh, uh, doesn't have to make. Uh, I say that uh, in jest, of course, but uh, you know, it's, it's tough work. And uh, you have to be able to lean back on that process. In my case, we closed seven schools in one year. It was, it was a remarkably difficult process. We went through a process. I remember working with parents and having upset parents when we had uh, change the uh, end date at the end of our school so we could have more professional development time for our teachers. Uh, significant issues. A variety of personnel issues that I, of course, can't get in the, uh, in the detail of, but you know, boy, personnel decisions at a local level are extremely difficult and they're sensitive. And uh, you know, you're doing the right thing for kids, but there are going to be people out in the community that aren't going to agree with you on that. So a variety of personnel decisions I've made over the years that were very, very difficult. Uh, 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 tax proposals. Uh, I, I don't want to underemphasize how difficult that is. I, I personally have a significant sensitivity for what we're asking local people in our community to to do in order to uh, uh, in order to you know move our organization you know to move to move our our schools forward for kids. And so you know you, you better be ready. You better be prepared. When we did our school closing plan, when we did our 190 million dollar bond issue multiple years uh, in, in preparation, making sure we had every detail covered and every question answered. Uh, so when we went, we had a strong plan and we had a, we had a justification for why we were asking for money. So that would be another example, specific example as it relates to those difficult decisions. Okay. Um, so we have about 30 minutes left and about eight questions. Okay. You guys just tell me, feel free to... <laughs> Get a hook. Yeah, I don't, I don't want... <laughs> 
I'm sorry. Uh, what is the most difficult decision you've had to make in the last two or three years, and what did you learn? Uh, and I'll be brief. The regional enhancement millage at our level, again, I, I just shared the sensitivity in regards to asking for a tax proposal. Add on to that that in Wayne County, we're a remarkably diverse uh, uh, group of communities. Uh, we have not always agreed, especially on tax proposals on a regional basis, what that should look like. Uh, we were on the ballot at the same point in time as a regional transportation uh, proposal. Uh, we, so we had a variety of things that were challenges for us. We had never passed this. Uh, uh, we had gone a, a couple of times earlier, didn't get it passed, uh, but we did the legwork that we needed to do. And what did, we, what, did we, what did I learn from that? I believe that if you can work on things that you have in common versus things that you have in differences, if you can focus on those things that you have in common and build off of those things, you can get to those bigger issues and move forward on the common good. Discuss in detail efforts you have taken personally to raise sustained student achievement and the results. What elements of these efforts should be present in the MDE strategic plan for educational improvement in the state? Well, again, uh, in Wayne County, this is a significant uh, 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 focus for us and, and a needed focus for us. I think uh, the first thing that I was able to do at a county level was change the conversation. <laughs> When we decided to go for that enhancement millage and get that enhancement millage, I, I told you that I meet with our, our superintendents every single summer, individually. I asked them, what are the two or three big things in your district next year? Because I want to know what's going on. And the conversation before was budgets, finance, contracts, 5% uh, requirements at the state, uh, all of these financial pressures. And after that passed, the conversation completely changed. And it was about improved programming, instruction. Here's what we're doing to reorganize our school district to, to better serve our kids. It completely changed the conversation. And that was first and foremost. Uh, uh, and again, that ties into the school finance research collaborative work, I believe. It's a game changer for us in regards to what we want our schools to focus on and, and the opportunity uh, uh, for us to be able to do that. And so from that led to uh, an also conversation that we had never had at the county level. We sat down. At our superintendent's meeting, we meet monthly, and we put up on, on, the, on the screen our student achievement data in Wayne County. We had all of our districts up there. We had multiple measures. We had different ways to look at it. We cared, compared ourselves to other counties. And we had a serious discussion about where we're at and what we need to do. The superintendents, to their credit, took to that information. And that is now the first thing on our agenda, every single superintendent's meeting that we have. We're focusing on literacy. We, bought, we brought Nell Duke in, who maybe you have all heard from, uh, who's a reading expert from Michigan. She punched us all in the face and told us what we needed to do in a short period of time and in a longer period of time. And we've been about doing that work. We now have a superintendent's literacy network, and we're excited about the process and progress that they're make, uh, making, uh, helping us uh, to move forward. Again, it's back to those components of um, school improvement and making sure that our school districts are being supported in those areas. In our, in our county, that's a challenge because we have uh, a variety of districts with a variety of needs. And so we've actually created a process that looks like MTSS for those that are familiar with it, where we have core services for every school district. And then for all of our school districts that are identified with some type of state designation, comprehensive, uh, targeted school, whatever it might be, if you have a state designation, you get supplemental services. We receive significant money from the federal government through you, regional uh, uh, assistance grant money to help support that work. And then the last part of that uh, piece is our, our intensive support, which is even more and above and beyond where it is at the supplemental level, and that's for our partnership schools. And so we're, we're regularly and uh, uh, ongoingly focused on this. We've created a process called the district study team. I mentioned that not all school districts have experts in all areas. We bring all of our experts from all our different content areas, assessment, uh, health, you name it. They come in and they sit down with the school team. And they say, OK, what are you going to focus on? All of our school districts are different. Some need curriculum. Some need support in regards to school improvement planning. Some need support in culture and climate. All need different things. But we, so we bring in this comprehensive group, and we sit down with our schools, and we say, OK, and this, is, this is really in those last two levels. We say, let's talk about what's going on here. Let's look at the good components of school improvement, and let's see what we can do to implement these and what we can do to support that. We're starting to see success. Uh, we uh, are very proud of the many schools that we were able to get e either off the old priority list or off the new comprehensive uh, school list. 
Uh, we're very proud that of our partnership schools and the two partnership schools now that have been through the 18 month benchmark process, that's Detroit with 26 schools and River, uh, River Rouge. They both have been identified by the state as on target to meet their 36 month goals. We're very proud of that. We're starting to see changes and improvements in as it relates to uh, early literacy, our, our, our third grade reading scores in the early adopters. I wanna highlight that in the early adopters of some of the literacy work. We're showing teeny bits of growth in some other areas, which we're proud of, but we have a lot more work to do. So, um, and so that is the focus of our work at Wayne Risa and been the focus of my uh, my work over the last four years. What do you see as the relationship of the Department of Education and local school districts and intermediate school districts? So you've said well, some of that. But. Yeah, I think we have to be aligned. I mean, I think we have to do a better job <laughs> of aligning that work. I would not suggest that there needs to be any changes in the structure. You know, people talk about that. There needs to be a change in the way that the overall big picture structure of Michigan is organized. I think the amount of energy and time that would have to be put into doing something like that would take us away from the important work of making sure that there's a quality teacher in every classroom and they have the resources that they need. That kind of work is not gonna have the impact that this other work is going to have. I think the structure that we have in place can work and, we, and, and, and does work, but I also would identify that there is certainly room for improvement. We can do a better job of being aligned with our ISDs and with our local <coughs> school districts. We all have strengths. I would throw in their educational organizations. We all have strengths. We all have areas that we can bring to the table that we can work on that will uh, help us move forward in those major goals in the top 10 and 10 that we've identified. I think we can do a better job. That's all about that lens, about what we bring from our table and what we can control. Uh, uh, the farther away we get them from the work, the less, you know, we, we, have to, we have to be cognizant, the less, you know, we, we can't build relationships with classroom teachers in local school districts across the state of Michigan. That, that's not our strength area. But we do have other strength areas in regards to inventorying the work that's available, resources, identifying best practices. This is from a, this is from a, a, a real detailed get the work done type of approach. But we all have different strengths that we bring to the process. And I think we have the opportunity to be more aligned in our work, more focused at Michigan Department of Education, how we fit in, because we want to be one educational system. If we're going to be successful, or we can be more successful if the more that we're aligned. Okay, so um, question 19. The U.S. Department of Education has identified Michigan's special education program as needing intervention. Due to poor academic excuse me, due to poor academic performance and low graduation rates. What steps would you take as state superintendent to improve special education? We're, we've been adding a, another question to this. Um, <clears throat> uh, many of us have been getting um, uh, feedback from parents um, uh, that are unhappy with the appeals process. They don't feel it is fair to parents. Um, and so there's some some that uh, seem to be identified. What would you do to improve the appeals process? So I'll, I'll start with the uh, uh, component of the determination ruling, which was a shock uh, for, I think, anybody working, uh, for those that are familiar with, with, with that. I, I was stunned when I saw it. I quickly asked our staff to give me the, the, the data on this. I, I couldn't understand this. How could we be the only state? So I went through, started going through the data, identified that there are a variety of areas where we just missed the mark. And you get like a one or a two, if I remember right, in order to come up with this overall rating. So we barely missed it. To some extent, uh, extent, it felt a little arbitrary, but that does not excuse where we're at overall in regards to supporting students with uh, disabilities. And so uh, when I think about that and the think th uh, of the work that needs to be done in that area, you know, remember that over half of our students across the state of Michigan are students that, you know, learning disabled, are receiving some kind of speech support, they're in general education classrooms. And so what are we doing to make sure that those general education classrooms are as prepared as they possibly can be and have the resources that they need to make sure that those students are being successful? We want them in those general education classrooms. We want a least restrictive environment. And so what are we doing to make sure, and it gets right back to those components of what good school improvement looks like and uh, implementing those particular uh, uh, strategies 
in our classrooms. If we have a strength, and it really gets me, you guys have heard of multi-tiered systems of support. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about first and foremost having a qualified, skilled teacher in the classroom with the resources that they need so they can provide the service to students. And then if we identify that the kids are still struggling, then we have additional supports that are there for them to make sure that their needs are met. And so, you know, we know how that work uh, uh, needs to be done. Uh, we need to make sure that we have, we have given the teachers the resources to do that. And we need to be continually monitoring that because um, first and foremost, that's, that's where a good a portion of our, our students are. I'm very concerned as it relates to uh, our other programs uh, with the shortage that we have in special education teachers. It is a significant issue. It's a significant issue in Wayne County. Uh, we had our uh, 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 autistic program, but we have a separate building for our most severe, severely uh, 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 impacted autism students uh, at Berger Baylor. At one time, we were nine teachers short in that building. That's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. By the way, I had a parent come and tell me at church it was unacceptable. <laughs> and I said, you're right. You're absolutely right, without a question. And so what are we doing to, and I, and I mentioned before things that we're doing to work on uh, uh, getting more teachers uh, uh, qualified and, and certified, but we, we have to be aggressive in that area and look outside the box, especially as it relates to special education. Are there other incentives that we can provide to make sure that we can get quality teachers into those classrooms? I would also highlight that I think we need to do some reflective work, not only in our programs and the way that the services are provided, but in our placement. I, uh, I don't believe that we are always uh, 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 putting students a, a, in the best placement uh, in, 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 in our own experience from the ISD level of reviewing a lot of countywide uh, special education programs. Students are not in the classroom that they should be in based on their disability and what their, what their skills are. And so I think that's a process that needs to be uh, reevaluated. And from a, from a standpoint as it relates to the process for um, uh, uh, for complaints uh, and, and, and that whole system. For me, can we do it faster? I have, uh, as a local superintendent and, and as an ISD superintendent, uh, I see a lot of, uh, uh, of the complaints that come forward, and it just seems in some cases it takes so long to address these issues, and these kids are out, out, not, haven't been placed in a program. It's, it's, it's wrong. And there has, so there has to be a way. I, I wish I could say, you know, it's X, Y, and Z. I, I don't have that. But we have to find a way to streamline that process, both for parents. Um, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's remarkably exhausting for parents and at times financially draining for parents as they get into that process. Uh, and we, we have to find a way to, to resolve some of these issues in a, in a, more, uh, a more expedited fashion for the kids because... As these things are drawn out, the kids are waiting for an answer, and it's, and it's unacceptable. Question number 20 is, what experience have you had in working in a complex organization that serves a highly diverse population, including those with special needs, diverse socioeconomic and educational levels, culture, race, and ethnicity? Please explain in detail. Well, Wayne County is the, uh, you know, uh, the, the picture of diversity. Uh, Wayne County, we have uh, 275,000 students, 33 school districts. We have uh, over 100 charter schools. We over, have over 100,000 African-American students. We have 34,000 kids with an IEP, 36,000 kids that are EL, 20,000 Hispanic students, 10,000 Asian students, we have a significant Arab population in Wayne County. We have some of the richest communities in the entire state, Gross Point, Northville. We have some of the poorest communities in the entire state. We have large school districts. Detroit's our biggest school district, but not just Detroit. We have four other of the top 10 school districts in the state, Dearborn, Livonia, Wayne Westland, uh, uh, Plymouth Canton. Big school systems. We have small school systems. We have school systems that have less than 2,000 students. We have uh, student, uh, communities that are rural. I uh, drove down to Flat Rock on Monday, drove by some cows and some horses on the way. They have 4-H program at Huron, and then we have urban communities. So we, we are as diverse as you can imagine and as, have a, as a rich an educational environment as you could, you could hope for. I think it's our strength. Uh, we all come together as a Wayne County community. Our 
business managers meet, our special education directors meet, our <coughs> superintendents meet, our <coughs> curriculum directors meet, they talk and they learn from each other because they all have significantly different experiences. And so that is a real, real strength of ours. One of our challenges is how do we allocate the services? And I shared with you the, the process that we, are, we, we put in place to do that with the core services to make sure that everybody in, in Wayne County gets some level of support from us, but then we have supplemental and intense services on top of that for those that need more. So I'm going to sneak in a question here, and that is um, a recent report uh, by Annie EKC Foundation found that uh, Michigan uh, is, is performing worse for African-American children. And what would you do to address that, that statistic? Yeah, uh, you know, for me, it starts at zero. And so uh, I mentioned earlier a, a particular program that we put in place. We know that by the age of four, a student living in an economically disadvantaged home compared to a student living in a, a wealthy home, uh, uh, the student living in the wealthy home has heard 30 million words more. It almost sounds incomprehensible, but it's the research. And so what are we doing to close those gaps for our kids? We're starting to talk about and have improved early childhood. We're talking about more preschool programs. School Finance Research Collaborative says not just four-year-olds, but three-year-olds ought to have a preschool experience. Before that, what are we doing to have those kids even ready before they get to the three or four year old experience that they have? And it, 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 we're trying to do it at scale. Um, we know that the resources are limited in that regard. So how do you do it at scale? We're actually getting volunteers. The curriculum that I talked about talking is teaching, very simple. Basic things about talking to your child, singing to your child, conversations about wherever you're at with your child, doing those things when their brains are developing can make a significant difference when they get to age of three and four. And the bottom line is the support has to continue at that point in time. We talk a lot about equity in, in uh, Wayne County. Uh, we actually uh, have implemented a variety of programs internally and externally. Our school districts ask for support in regards to how do we support uh, students that are uh, minorities in our school, especially as we're seeing a changing environment in some of our school systems. They're asking us, we need culture and climate support. And so we have specific programs related to that, that supports, but I'm gonna come back to the School Finance Research Collaborative. We have an internal group that sits and talks about what we can do to promote equity in our, in our communities, and what can we do to promote equity within our organization here in, in, in Wayne County. And when we talk about that, I say, boy, you know, and they're like, well, what should we do? What should we do? And I said, well, look at the research in the School Finance Research Collaborative. It identifies students and says that if we have students that are economically disadvantaged or if they're EL learners or if they are at risk in some other way, if they're students with disabilities, we need to recognize that they're gonna need additional supports. And so that doesn't start or end in third grade or fifth grade. We used to do reading recovery in Livonia. Get every first grader up to reading level, very intensive, very expensive. You, get every, you take the bottom 20% of your kids, you get them up to reading level. What happens by the time they're in sixth grade, that starts to dissipate if you don't have continued supports for those kids. That's what the Research Collaborative is all about, providing those supports, not just in the third grade, not in kindergarten. We start at zero and we build all the way up through their entire experience to make sure that they have what they need to be successful. Excuse me, I'm gonna close this door. Yeah, I was gonna say, me, can you I ask can... them to be quiet? <laughs> I want to make sure that we're focused on you. <laughs> so we I think I'm doing pretty good. I got a couple minutes left. Yes, we have about yeah. 15 minutes left, and you have three questions. So you're you're doing good. <laughs> what do you consider to be your major strengths as a leader? What would you target for personal and personal or professional improvement if you are hired for this position? And I'm going to ask that you give measurables and to also let us know the districts that you've worked in, where, where the graduation rate was when you started and where it was when you finished. Okay, <coughs> so the, 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 the first overall question was? What do you consider to be your major strengths okay. as right. a leader? Okay, I was trying to tie that into the, the last component there. So when I, when I look at that, I, I had a chance to, to, to talk a little bit about that uh, earlier, but I would identify my ability to motivate staff and I think that comes from a sincere belief by staff that I believe in them. I value the work that they do. 
and I advocate for them. And so in doing that, I think that they trust me and, and they come to work and they, and they want to work. Building relationships, another significant uh, uh, strength of mine, uh, both within the organization but outside of the organization. And I shared with you multiple examples of how I'm actively involved in a lot of different organizations uh, uh, that, that really supports that, that uh, strength that I would identify. And last, again, I would just highlight that uh, we deal with complex issues here. And sometimes we get stuck in regards to how we move forward on them. And I, I think one of my strengths is I'm able to take complex issues, break them down, identify areas and steps to move forward with in those things, and then put the plan together and move it forward. And so those, those are uh, the strengths that I would ad identify. Uh, uh, personal professional development opportunities, first and foremost, I think for whomever the new superintendent is, certainly I would want to get in and really develop a deeper understanding of every single service and department that's within the department. Uh, I tangentially am involved with the Michigan Department and have been for 30 years in a variety of different ways. That's different from actually being here doing the work every day with, 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 with uh, the colleagues here that work at the Michigan Department of Education. So I would definitely want to get in and really understand in depth what's going on and what we're identifying as the value add in each of our different components of the department. Separately from that, I would just identify that I've been on this journey now uh, for several years in regards to understanding better equity and diversity. And so we were, uh, I think, the first ISD anywhere to internally uh, start to provide a program for our staff called Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity within the organization. It's a program we actually sent staff off, some of our culture and climate staff, to be trained in. And we're working internally with our uh, staff on that. It's been fascinating work. I can't even tell you uh, the personal growth that you have walking out of those sessions after spending some time really looking at yourself and looking at the issues that, that, that we face uh, as, a, as a school community and as, just as a society as, as, as a whole. Uh, we were actually uh, recognized by the uh, uh, Race and uh, Human Relations Committee uh, or Commission down in the metropolitan Detroit area for that work because we were one of the first to take that on. So I want to continue that work for myself. I don't want that to go away if I end up leaving the work that we've been doing down at Wayne Risa. Um, and then, uh, again, I've worked in uh, a variety of uh, different school systems, and uh, Wayne Westland was the first school system that I worked in. Then it was the Livonia Public Schools where I worked for about 20 years and now I've been at Wayne Risa for four years. And so the graduation rates have fluctuated. Uh, there are different communities and they, they, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, different uh, backgrounds and, and uh, different levels of education within the family, different economic, uh, 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 different economic issues in those communities. And so you would, see, you would see this in the graduation rates. We had decent graduation rates in, in Wayne Westland. In Livonia, we were in the you know, upper 90% uh, across Wayne County. Uh, I think we're in the, in the 70s as it relates to our overall uh, graduation rates on the improve. Wayne Westland, where was it when you started and when, where, where was it when you left? Uh, I, that I, I, I just couldn't remember off the top of my head. I started in 1986 there and left in 1990. Okay. Uh, and I, I do not remember exactly where the graduation rates were at that time. In Livonia, we were, we were uh, uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the 90, 90th percentile and pretty much holding steady over that period of time. Uh, yeah, and a little bit different at our three, uh, three high schools, but pretty hold, holding pretty steady over that time. And in, in Wayne County, we've actually been seeing some growth in the graduation rate. Can you discuss your experience in creating, implementing, and or overseeing policies and procedures related to school and student safety? Yes. Uh, a significant amount of experience again here with your local superintendent, uh, this has uh, been a high priority. I can tell you uh, without exception, uh, the toughest uh, several days in my career, and nothing was even close to it, and that was uh, uh, the shooting in Newtown. Uh, that elementary school uh, shooting uh, shook the school community like I've never seen. And, you know, boy, I mean, if you were an educator, uh, you quickly realized, if you didn't realize it every day going to school, the immense responsibility that you have to protect kids. And the immense, it, it was, I mean, it was, it was a sock in the gut like I had never experienced. Yeah, we had to pick ourselves up. Uh, I remember it was a Friday when we got the news. 
uh, Saturday, we were at my house with my, our leadership team developing plans because we had to be the leaders and we had to step up and make sure that our kids, our parents, and our staff were going to feel comfortable when they came back to school. We have put out multiple different communications with them. We have a process in place. We had a process, still have a process in place for triage. If there's an emergency in your school district, you have your counselors and your social workers and your psychologists ready and ready to go. Thankfully, you know, we can do that at scale in a larger school system. We had that ready to roll. But I have to tell you, those, those following days were nothing like I've ever experienced. People were seeing things. I mean, they were literally seeing things. Outside the windows, it was the, 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 the tension was, uh, was immense and the level of responsibility just hit us uh, like a way I've never, I've never felt before. I mean, I, like I said, I've had to make a lot of tough decisions, but those three days were the worst days uh, of my career. We were fortunate in Livonia to be able to put together a very comprehensive student safety plan. Uh, everything from having the manuals in place that have all the scenarios laid out. We actually put together a flip chart for our staff. So if you were a teacher, you could sit at your desk and there would be just a flip chart. You wouldn't have to go through your manual if there was something going on in the building. You'd have a flip chart that you'd be able to go to and identify uh, what you were supposed to do. Uh, we had uh, put together uh, a significant support staff, uh, uh, primarily at the secondary level. Working with our local law enforcement, we had police officers in the building. We had other st staff in the building there to support student safety. We, uh, uh, with our bond issue, completely redid all of the entryways in our school districts to make sure that they were very safe. Technology that we put in, cameras, buses in the buildings, uh, we did all that. We actually had a supervisor, a former police officer, uh, that we hired in the district to coordinate all of these activities for us. So we were very proactive in regards to putting together a very strong safety plan. Um, and I feel, by and large, again, scale helps a lot. But by and large, because I actually asked our superintendents this uh, summer, I said, hey, you know, would you like Wayne Risa to hire someone who would be a school safety expert, who could go know all the rules, know the best practices, could come out and help? And they actually said, nah, you know, from a priority standpoint, that isn't a, a high priority for us at this point in time. Because a lot of the school districts now have pretty good processes and uh, procedures in place. Um, the thing I would add to that that's really important, that is, you know, we can prepare um, a whole lot, but we, you can't stop every single instance uh, that, that potentially could happen in a school. And so we need to be focusing on proactive work with kids. And if we can prevent the kid from doing something tragic at a school because we had the appropriate support for them when they were struggling, that to me is really, really important because we're not going to be able to resolve every single issue from a safety standpoint. We just can't. It's impossible. I mean, people will figure out how to, how to do something. I hate to say that so bluntly. It's just the reality of life. And, but if we can help those kids before they get to that point, that's how I think we have our best chance of stopping these kinds of, these kinds of, these kinds of incidents. Thank you. Last question, Randy. Uh, what will public education be like in the future? Uh, well, you know, I, I, you hear a lot of things. I mean, you know, everything from spaceships to, you know, everybody's just going to be sitting in their <laughs> bedroom with their virtual reality helmet on, which, of course, will be glasses, I'm sure, in three years. Um, and so you have, you know, all that uh, type of uh, 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 thinking in people's minds. Uh, I'm a little bit more grounded in my, in my thought process on that. Um, and part and parcel of thinking of that is, I actually go back 25 years. We were implementing in 19, in the mid 90s uh, in Livonia, a uh, technology bond issue. And I remember I was in charge of making sure that it was implemented and et cetera. And I remember we were darn getting staff, they won't use email. That was 19, it doesn't seem that long ago. I have to tell you, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel that long ago. Staff wouldn't use the email. It's like, come on, you guys, you can do this. This isn't that hard. I mean, think where we've come from that period of time to today. Yet, right, I mean, we've come a long ways. Yet, we still have school. We still have adults. We still have the activities that we know represent school. And so the growth that I've seen over that period of time really has to do with tools for teachers and working with kids. And that has completely changed. That has completely changed. What teachers have access to to work with, with kids today is mind-blowing. Yeah, you know, everything from, you know, Khan Academy to apps where kids can go up and learn how to complete a math lesson or a math, a, a math equation. 
uh, everything you can think of is available there at the fingertips. We can talk to a group of kids halfway across the world, just like that. I mean, those opportunities were not there for us uh, 25 years ago, and so they're here for us now, and I think that will continue to advance and mature over time. What I think will still be there, though, are schools, and I think there is an uh, intrinsic value to human interaction. We learn from each other. Kids learn from each other. And that interaction with each other is a significant component of how we learn and what we learn. And so we, we will never let go of that. But let's not forget that our schools are, in many cases, the hub of our communities. And so if there is something that ex is exciting that happened in your community, if there's a tragedy that happened in your community, it is the school that is the hub that often is the place where people gather and uh, deal with those issues. That, I don't think, is going to, away, gonna, going to go away. Are the lines going to continue to be blurred? Absolutely. When you think about dual enrollment, uh, 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 early college, uh, uh, you know, uh, attaining credits through universities, that, that whole line between post-secondary and credentialed opportunities for kids and traditional high school, those lines have, have, are, are a lot different today than they were 25 years ago. And I think those lines will continue to be blurred as we move forward. There'll be more opportunities. You know, we talk about competency-based education and those concepts, some neat things uh, related to how school looks. And so I could see definitely tools changing, maybe some of the format changing, um, but there's still going to be a, a place where people call school. Great. Thank so you. we are essentially out of time. However, if you want to, if there's any last minute thing that you want to make sure that we know or any pressing question you have, uh, this is your opportunity to. Yeah, I don't have a pressing question. You know, I, I, I would just uh, <coughs> summarize by saying, you know, I think we're at a unique point in time here in Michigan. And uh, uh, I think you guys have done a great job of picking people who can move our state forward. Having someone who has the experience of what's going on in Michigan. Uh, knowing the players, having those relationships, understanding where we're at with the top 10 and 10, uh, with the school finance research work that's happening, uh, you know, they're going to be able to move, move this work forward. We're at a unique point in time where I think not just the education community, but our business community, our parents, people are coming together to say things have, something has to be different in Michigan. And uh, I'm just excited to potentially help make that happen. Well, thank you so much for your interest and for spending your day with us today. Thank you. And with that, we are going to break for lunch. We will be back at 1.30.